Welcome back. Gosh, everything is so synchronized with the web and so on. So natural, so, so much spontaneity. So good to have you back all here. Uh, we're going to, to proceed. And in fact, it, it is time to, to assess what can the EU realistically do to, uh, to achieve the widening process? What should be the short term, the medium term priorities and to conduct the next session? It is my pleasure to hand over to my colleague and our executive editor, Florian Jubascu. I'll hand over to you and I leave you just tell us what's new on the editorial side first, and then you'll have the pleasure to welcome Madame Commissioner Gabriel. So, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat my name. Uh, it's Florin Zubashko. I'm executive editor of Science Business, and I have the great pleasure today to announce that we're launching the Widening Initiative. Um, this is a dedicated newsletter uh, that will cover issues related to the research innovation divide and or innovation cohesion, as uh, uh, Madame Commissioner likes to call it uh, in Europe, uh, which will be paired with a series of events and, and other uh, activities uh, around uh, this topic. Um, so the, the reason we're doing this is, is very simple. As you'll know, um, there is a performance gap uh, in Europe. Uh, so not, not all countries are performing the same. Uh, they shouldn't perform the same, but uh, where potential is available, we should tap into it and exploit it. And um, that's, that's what we're trying to do with, the, with this newsletter, is, is to look at this issue uh, step by step and see what are the problems and where are the pockets of excellence um, in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, and what we can do to help them connect with the rest um, of Europe. Uh, so, and this is important because e, the EU wants to assert its scientific and technological prowess uh, around the globe. And, and the main question is, can it do so while half the continent is somewhat falling behind? Um, so, uh, if you go to our website today, uh, to uh, www.sciencebusiness.net forward slash widening, you'll see um, the stories that we uh, published today in the first edition of the newsletter. There, there we, you will also have the opportunity to, to sign up and, and get the, um, the next uh, issue. Now. Uh, the, the newsletter today has uh, a very important component, uh, and that is an exclusive op-ed from Commissioner Gabriel um, on this issue. Um, and I, I'm extremely pleased to welcome her today on stage to discuss about these issues uh, uh, a bit further. So uh, please uh, join me on stage. Commissioner, thank you very much for coming. Um, I know this is a topic very close to your heart, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just dive into it. Um, so why do you think it is important for the EU to have a more cohesive uh, research innovation uh, landscape? Well, first of all, congratulations for your initiative, because I think that by spreading information, sharing good practices, giving visibility to success stories everywhere, in every corner in all our regions in Europe, we have much more chances to reaffirm our leadership that we already have in science, in some key strategic industrial sectors. But now, if you'd like definitely to assume our role that being a leader in the time that we are living, that means to be inclusive, that means to, be, to pay attention to all our regions, to our talents, that's why we need to pay attention to this issue. So again, for me, when we talk about the excellence of the European leadership in innovation, in research, in education, we always have to say that Excellence and access to excellence are the both sides of the same coin. That means that, again, we need to look into detail 
where are our weaknesses, how we can tackle them, and again, without the potential of all the member states, all the regions, we'll never tackle the challenges linked to the green and digital transition, and we'll never seize the opportunity that we have now with the new wave of innovation, the so-called deep tech innovation. Um, why do you prefer innovation cohesion instead of the research innovation gap or divide or... Uh... Well, I think that every single word counts. And when we talk about divide, somehow even unconscious bias are starting to, put in, to be put in place. So I think that if you'd like to say to all our regions, to our talents, that we are taking care of them, that we would like to have them on board. Since the beginning, our narrative, uh, our words have to include them. And that's why I prefer definitely a positive narrative, narrative which is inclusive and not again accentuating what is dividing us, what, what is really making a difference between the different member states or regions or, or different communities. Uh, thank you. Um, now, thanks to some uh, political debates that we had uh, a few years back, the widening program, uh, the, its budget, it's much bigger now uh, than it was under Horizon 2020. So, uh, can we already see the impact of that? Well, it will be a little bit premature to talk about impact because the projects in the biggest part didn't start yet. So we need, to, that's always the, bi the, the, the small frustration with Horizon Europe, Horizon 2020 program. We need to see in the long term. But what, what is important for me is two things. First, when we talk about the widening component, it's tr true that we managed to triple the budget from 1 billion to 3 billion. We already have existing positive measures like twinning or teaming or error chairs. What is good is that now what we need is to simplify them. And you know that, for example, there is a new approach for teaming, not to have two procedures and to have now the two stages in one single application. And it's important to see how the access to complementary funding is taken into consideration because it's very important. Horizon Europe will not do all the things in, it, in itself. And that's the new training scheme. That's not all. What for me is important, what are the new elements? We have now a new hop-on mechanism. And I very much hope that this time there will be a positive impact. Can what is the hop-on mechanism yeah. is allowing existing consortia without members coming from widening countries to have them as member. And you know, here the critics that we very often hear is that some of the consortia are working like closed clubs and we need to need to send to send a message. So let's see if it will work and if it will work, we can see how we can expand this. Another important issue for me is that sounds quite maybe bureaucratic, strengthening national contact points. I'm always asking in all our member states, do you know the name of the national contact points? And believe me, there is not so much people that are aware who are those national contact points. What is important for me is that now we would like to have a pre-proposal checks with the national contact points. Because from in these countries, very often the error is small. They even don't know that because of this small error, they will be never qualified. So that's something positive, And for me, it will be important to follow it very, very closely. Final point, I think that it's always important to, to raise uh, how crucial is for us the program cost. Because now we have some important uh, numbers. Actually, cost is an incubator for successful applications because applications coming from widening country via cost, they are two and a half times more successful than the others. And what is good is that now they have a budget of 400 million euros within Horizon Europe and they decided to allow to, to have 50% of this budget for widening countries. Good, but I would like to stop here for the widening component because I have a very, a very much more important plea to, 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 to make. Let's not talk about widening and widening countries only by staying focused on widening component of Horizon Europe program. After all, it's 3.3% of the entire budget, which is 95.5. Mm -hmm. For me, what is important is how with this component, 
and how with other means we can encourage much more the participation of these countries in the other pillars or elements in Horizon Europe. Now I think that for the last two years it's very clear that for us it's a priority and I would like to share only two for me very encouraging examples. Last call with European Innovation Council Accelerator for the first time 12% of the successful applications selected are coming from widening country, from EU 13. And I'm always making the comparison. Remember the Green Deal call, 1 billion, 14% of applications coming from EU 13, no one selected in the final stage. So this time here, we have a member of our board, dear Kinga, I'm sure that you will talk much more about this. I very much count on them because there is a working group within the European Innovation Council board working on this issue. And we'll dare to raise some of the important and not so very often talked issues like the role of consultants, the bias of evaluators. We need to talk about this. The second, <laughs> the second element that is very encouraging for me is our missions. That's one of the main novelties in Horizon Europe program. We selected the first 100 cities to participate in the climate and smart cities mission. 36 out of 100 are coming from EU 13. Oh. So it, that means that if the information, the same information is here at the same time like, like for all the others, the quality of information is here if there is much more transparency and much more uh, real regular dialogue, it's, it, there is a, a lot of potential. And I believe, I believe that we need to continue on this, on this path. And uh, for me, the main, the main challenge is let's not talk only about the widening component within Horizon Europe for the widening countries, but let's talk about their participation in the entire Horizon Europe program because actually they are participating in order of 6-7% and simply it's not fair. EU 13, 6%, EU 15, 94%. For me, the potential is everywhere. Um, you mentioned the budget um, and you are trying to convince member states to spend a bit more and to reach that 3%, that magic 3% target. Um, do you think that uh, we can use this momentum that we have in uh, this political momentum around the European research area to get that, um, uh, to achieve that? Well, certainly not only with European research area. And I'm commissioner for researcher, not supposed to say that, but I am very pragmatic. First, I think that we have to seize the momentum and the opportunities that the new European research area are providing to us because actually for the first time we have a European research area forum and the European research area policy agenda with 20 actions where we can see that more than half of our member states in July already very, very rapidly committed on some of those actions in order to see how they, they can increase their participation. It's true that when we talk about the 3% of GDP, a very big part is on laying on the responsibility of our member states. So we need to encourage them to invest much more. And how to encourage them? I believe in the strength of the examples. They need to, say, to see that they have access, that they can use the opportunities that are provide, provided. And that's why I think that it's important to insist on synergies. I have much more chances to, to convince the ministers of finance, not only of research, that it's important to invest in research innovation if they see that there is synergies with the European Regional Development Fund. There is synergies now with the resilience and recovery facility uh, plans because there is a lot of put, uh, emphasis that is put on startups, on innovation ecosystems, on the cooperation between business and academia. So for me, now what is different, and we have to, to keep this, this, this challenge and this objective of the 3%, is that we are not only counting on the European research area and on the budget dedicated to research. We need now to, to see how these synergies can, be, can become operational and to use 50 billion euros in the resilience and recovery facility plans are dedicated to research innovation, cohesion policy, another 50 billion. Of course, it's now up to all of us 
very closely with our member states to see how we can transform this wish to invest much more into something concrete. You said something interesting, that it, it's perhaps easier now to convince finance ministers of the importance of R&D investments. Uh, starting from that, we know that in times of economic crisis, the first budgets that go down are, are research. We saw that in 2008, and we saw it in, in rich countries uh, where uh, the funding, it, it, it took them a, a quite, a, quite some time to get back to the pre-crisis pre levels. So uh, do you think that this political momentum in favor of R&D investments could be jeopardized in some way by you know, the, what will happen next uh, in Europe, um, in, in the European ec economy? No, I think that we have to, to promote what we, we have learned with the pandemic, how important it is to invent in research innovation. Because if you were able to have a vaccine in less than one year, it was exactly because for many years before an investment was made in research in those areas. So I think that if you'd like to be better prepared, to be much more resilient for future crises, it's obvious that we need to invest much more in research and innovation. And again here, it's really important for me to promote the triangle research, innovation and education. Because what we see, for example, with our European Universities Alliances, they all integrated research and innovation in their work. The, the biggest part of our alliances are using money from Horizon Europe because they are fully aware that if you'd like to have the European universities of the future, so those talents with the right skills and competencies, they need to integrate research and innovation since the beginning. And you know here, widening countries are not only motivated, are not showing only enthusiasm on this initiative, but they are those that spontaneously made a national contribution to this initiative. I have much more resistance from other countries and it's not the usual suspects. Okay. Um, I, I would like to change topic a bit now uh, and, and focus on a discussion that we started in the first session of this conference and that's uh, the war in Ukraine and how that has changed international uh, science cooperation. Um, What's your opinion? How do you think the, the Ukrainian crisis will affect the EU's capacity to um, bridge this uh, innovation, research innovation divide? Um, well, first I would like again to express our full solidarity with Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. I think that the most important thing is to stay united, as we already have shown that since the very first day of this completely unjustified war and aggression of Russia to, to Ukraine. Second, I'm very grateful to the research and innovation community because, and education community. They reacted since the very beginning with an extraordinary openness, solidarity. Don't forget, we have ERA for Ukraine, one-stop shop where all these informations are available. We, we have a lot of initiatives. All our universities were immediately here. Now, for me, there is some important initiatives like the 25 million euros for Maris Klodowska Curie actions or very recently the 20 millions that we decided to allow together with the European Innovation Council to support Ukrainian startups. Something important, we need to pay attention not to reproduce some of, some of the, the errors of the past and for Ukraine it's important to avoid the brain drain. We need to build bridges. We need to, 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 to build ecosystems. That's why for me, this situation, and I see every crisis as an opportunity, that's something in our history as European Union, that's an opportunity, at least for three things. Because first, with Ukrainians, startups, universities, researchers, we are applying this ecosystem approach. It's important to, to strengthen this cooperation. We are talking about talents, and these talents need this support at this moment to nurture them, to be ready to return or to stay in their countries. By the way, one extraordinary capacity of resistance, that is the example of the Ukrainian startups. When we announced the launch of this action with the European Innovation Council, the Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine said that 70% of the Ukrainian startups 
stayed in Ukraine during the entire war and they continue to operate. So this resistance is something that we have all to benefit by allowing them to, to, to expand their activities. And finally, it's not only about an ecosystem approach, it's not only about talents and solidarity, it's about tackling common challenges. Health, green, digital, all these challenges are absolutely common and we can only win if we strengthen the, the cooperation. From the green transition, the question of energy is the main question today. We need clean technologies, we need to innovate in this field. From to the digital, and here cybersecurity is not a small topic, so we need, we need, and I think that that's, an, that that's an opportunity, and what I have seen already in the different member states is that our different communities of researchers, innovators, universities are very, very much uh, mobilized, and they will continue to do so. What do you think of the response of uh, Ukraine's immediate neighbors in the EU, uh, countries like Poland and Romania and Hungary? Uh, what do you think of, of, of the scientific community in those countries and, uh, and the response they had uh, so far? Because you were talking about building bridges, so I wonder whether those bridges should be stronger in that region, so in the immediate neighborhood of, of, of the country. Well, I'm not sure that it's only in the immediate neighborhood. For sure, there is much more concentrated persons and it says people there uh, and the reaction was very positive was immediate at least that's the examples that i have in mind but i think that that's that's something that we should use as opportunity for europe it's not only for the neighboring countries it's for every one of us yeah um final question uh because i know we have to go um we don't know when this war is gonna end so what would be your advice to the research and innovation community in Europe to uh, how should they plan for the, for the future uh, in, in this um, world of uncertainty? My advice is to listen much, much more often, we politicians, to the research, innovation and education communities because they are better prepared, they are very spontaneous in their solidarity, in their mobilization, in concrete actions that are putting in place because they know the ground. My advice, it will be not to them, my advice will be to all these uh, politicians to be really much more attentive to what we have learned, what we can learn from the community of uh, researchers, innovators and universities. So that message goes to politicians in the capitals as well? Everywhere. Everywhere. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like to uh, invite you all to uh, applaud Madame Commissioner. Thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure.